Um, I found that very interesting, actually, very interesting, informative uh, presentation. I live here, and I didn't know all that stuff. So I imagine this is uh, it's new for a lot of few people to see that series of laws that have helped improve the environment over time, and um, and to recognize there's been an impact. I mean, it has improved things. Um, for example, I grew up in Silicon Valley, out in California, and I remember when they had a lot of air pollution there uh, as a child. And you can remember, oh, it was a smoggy day, but they used the word haze. They said it's a hazy day. They didn't really know what smog was, and uh, they didn't recognize it. And when you go out now, because of the controls on pollution on cars, the cars can't pollute like they used to. And you can't just burn trash out in the street and the fields. The air is very clean, and I've seen how the environment's gotten better in that case. So I think it's encouraging because we hear so many things about how the environment's getting worse, the world's running out of this, and all these terrible things, and you can do something about it. I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. It may take, it may be an incremental process that happens in little pieces over time, but you can improve things, or at least keep them from getting bad, getting worse. And that leads into the question of sustainability. How many of you are familiar with that term, sustainability, environmental sustainability? Okay. Well, in a general sense, do you want to say what you think it means? Okay. In general sense, it's, it's, it's a term that we call a buzzword today. A buzzword meaning it's used a lot. You read about it in the newspaper, and magazines, on television. It's important because what it expresses is the idea that something can continue in the future and not make things worse. In other words, it, 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 it is sustainable financially, environmentally, and so that it continue offering the benefits without having large costs that society has to bear or the environment has to bear. It's an important term. I work in urban planning. I'm an urban planner. I design cities and facilities and military bases and stuff like that. And that sustainability is a very important concept now because we think about new development and new communities and urban revitalization in a different manner, that it needs to be able to exist for a long period of time and not extract so many resources from the environment and try to be more balanced and doesn't pollute. And so that sustainability is a very, very important concept um, that we try to bring into our work is to design communities and buildings that are sustainable. Okay. So when Kathy asked me if I'd like to speak, and we and she said it, the, co the topic was saving, you know, um, preserving the environment, or how do we maintain environmental quality? I thought about how that affects my work as an urban planner, and I work mostly on very specific projects. And so what I thought I'd talk about is how you can enhance or sustain or preserve the environment. While, do, while actually changing it by doing development. And I'm just going to talk about a project that we, a, big, a new community that we've been working on for over, for over 10 years in Denver called Stapleton. And we're going to speak a little bit about that as an example of how we try to make things sustainable. So is everybody kind of on board with that? Okay. Um, and first of all, before, well, we'll talk about Stapleton. <coughs> Has anybody here heard of the Stapleton development in Denver? Okay, I'll explain what it is. It's a very large community that's being redeveloped on a former airport site in Denver. And, and it's, a, it's a whole new place to live and everything that you can visit. It's really quite, quite spectacular. Um, the first thing I just wanted to introduce is basically, it's a civics question. Um, what Tim was talking about was a federal level of government right here, federal. That's the whole United States. And that they pass, the federal government passes legislation and rules that apply to the entire country, okay? Well, we have other levels of government in the United States. We have the state level, which is Colorado, and we have 50 states. And those states have their rules. Many of them are passed through for the federal government, okay? And then within the states, we have, of course, local. And I really work at the local level, okay? That's cities, okay? And what do cities do? And cities approach environmental protection in a different way because cities have different opportunities. 
They need to follow the rules set by the federal government, but they still have opportunities to make things better. So the local level, we're going to talk about this project. And, um, and specifically, I think an interesting thing is the, at the local level, it's where you actually do things. And, and, and you can actually affect the results of projects. And so the Stapleton project is an example of the collaboration between the city and county of Denver, which is a, a local municipality, and a private development company, as well as other, other stakeholders, as federal government and other players, to produce a project. Okay. This is Stapleton, and to get, this is Denver, okay? This is Interstate 70 on the way to the airport. DIA is out here. Downtown is out here. And it's approximately at Quebec and Interstate 70, if you know where that is. And so it would be in this direction if you're oriented in this room. What's interesting about it, it's 4,700 4, acres. And so you know an acre, a hectare is about two and a half acres. So it's a large site. It's the former site of the Denver International Airport, which was closed in 1994, I believe, 19, around 1994, when we built the new DIA out in the countryside. But this used to be a very large international airport. Okay, the decision was made once they built DIA that they could redevelop this. And the city owned the land, and so they worked with a private developer to create a new community, and it was to be designed and planned along sustainable principles. In other words, they wanted this to be a real innovative community, just not a just not your standard new, new community. They wanted to, to save energy, they wanted to be sustainable, they wanted to have a lot of things. And so um, I began working on this in about 1991, and my firm has continued to work on it. And it's really become a model for um, a new community development in the world. It's gotten a lot of international awards. Um, and I think I will point out, the site was contaminated and had to be cleaned up beforehand. It was not a super fun site, but it had some contamination. So it was a, a case that well, they had to clean it up, clean up the ground and, use, and carefully destroy some of the buildings and the structures before construction could, um, could, could continue. And so it's considered, and, and, uh, it's considered to be a good example about how you can actually build things, but in a sustainable manner. Okay, there. Okay, I got that. And, and I might add that one other thing about sustainability has to do with finances. And, you know, is it financially sustainable? Will it make money and be able to pay for itself? And an interesting concept here is, in fact, taxes generated on the site through the sale of item sales tax and property taxes have actually paid for the infrastructure. So it hasn't required a massive um, influx of capital from the outside. So it's, it's environmentally sustainable, but it's also financially sustainable. Um, it seemed to stop. Anybody know how to make it go? It looks like no, your map is highlighted or something. How if do we fix that? If you just there. click on the words, Martina, do you know? There we go. Okay. And and I'll, I'll to, to kind of... Um, present this, I'm going to just talk about the principles that it was planned according to. And principles are different from regulations. Does anybody, are you familiar with the term principle? It's, it's what you would characterize as aspirational. It's saying this is kind of the way we'd like it um, and we want to aspire to it. That's why they say aspirational. They want to aspire to it. And it's and and we're not really rigid about how it, it how it occurs. So there are about ten aspirational principles that it was planned towards, 
that then um, that have that that have been a guiding um, guiding means to to go forward with the project. And I'm just going to talk about those because those smart growth principles are are in wide use throughout the United States today for planning communities. They're, they're sort of, these are all really good things to try to do, okay? Because if you follow them conscientiously, then you should be able to have a sustainable environment, okay? And I'll show the picture here is this is just an enlargement of the, the uh, plan, the master plan for the project up close. And this is actually where it looks like today because it is about half developed. They planned on taking 20 years to develop it. It'll be developed in about 20 years, even with the economy going like this. Okay. Okay, these are sort of urban planning principles. The first one is that it's important for sustainability to have a mixture of land uses. That means that you have to have housing and commercial and office and public uses in close proximity because people can walk around. They, they don't have to use a car as much and those, those uses support each other. So this project has a mixture of land uses. It isn't just one large area of housing and another large area of, of, of uh, office. It's all knitted together. Okay. The second, the second principle is to take advantage of compact building design. That's very important. There's a tendency, or there had been in the United States, because we had a lot of land to just spread buildings out, make big, broad buildings with big parking lots, and just use lots of land. That's not good, because it uses a lot of land. It results in more environmental impacts, pollution, use of materials, and it forces people to drive in cars, because they have to go from one thing to another by an automobile. And so a compact building design and land use pattern enables people to go there and then walk. And so they're healthier, they don't get so fat, and they don't use so much gasoline and pollute the air. So that's the second principle. Okay. The third principle is to have a variety of housing. Okay, and this, when they say to create a, a range of housing opportunities and choices, that means to have different kinds of housing, meaning apartments, single family houses, maybe high rises, have those that have a lot of um, choices so different kinds of people come there and so that the the, the project, the area, is affordable for multiple people. You don't, one of the problems in a lot of urban areas is the rich people can live downtown, the poor people live two hours away. Okay? That means the poor people who come to work in the city have to trans, transport a long, long time. There's more pollution and it's, there's a, a lot of problems that result from that. And one of the ideas at Stapleton is that it can be affordable for a lot of different kinds of people with different income levels to live there. They have inexpensive housing, they have rental housing, they have very expensive housing, you know, in terms of income level, you know, the housing probably goes from about 150000 to over a million, okay, so there's a real range. And they have different kinds of housing, so they have, you know, some people might want an apartment, some people want a house or a yard, some people want to live in a loft, they've got all that kind of stuff. So that's really an important thing for a sustainable community. And you think about it, it's like cities used to be built in the old days, before we started making all these new ones. Okay, you want walkable neighborhoods. Okay, again, it relates to the, the mix of land use and the compact design. Walkability is important in that it, you, you don't have the use of cars, the resources associated with cars is healthier for people. And in fact, what's interesting, they've done studies, recent studies that have determined that people who use public transit in the United States are about 10 pounds less in weight than people who just drive their cars. I mean, there's, it's actually, they've done a study, they've determined that people use public transport lose weight, and they're healthier. If you think about sustainability, well, that will sustain your life, because you're healthier, you're not getting fat. And, and you know, and it's certainly a problem in this country, and it's becoming a problem in other countries. Obesity is a huge, huge problem, from a cost to health and lifestyle and everything. So walkability, walkability is real important, you know, and there's all kinds of other more qualitative um, improvements. I mean, you see people, you talk to people, you interact more, etc. Um, but walkability is important. So when you plan a city, when you plan this, these neighborhoods, this is actually, this was neighborhood one that I worked on. It had, 
this is empty, it's sort of hard to see. But it had single family houses, it had apartments here, it had like lofts here, it had a little commercial center here, shopping center, offices, <coughs> parks, all that was within about, um, see this block here, that's a typical city block. It's pretty close to what a block is around DU. So within about a 10 by 10 block area, which is about the size of DU, you had everything you needed. And in fact, you might look at the area around DU as being a pretty good scale urban environment. You can get around, there's restaurants, or stores, you can walk to the grocery. This is a good prototype to think about. That doesn't exist in most new communities. This is an old traditional community. It exists and that's why we like it and people want to live here. What we tried to do is create that sense and that scale in a new community. So here's a neighborhood that has those things. Here's a neighborhood, that's a neighborhood, that's a neighborhood, that's a neighborhood, etc. Okay? So we try to have that. Okay. The um, five, foster distinctive and attractive communities with a sense of place. In other words, good design. You want buildings that are really attractive. Okay, attractive buildings that you want to go there. You want parks that are attractive. And that design counts. I think that's one of the things about smart growth, is you want to make extra efforts to make it work well for the people who live there and visit there and be attractive. Another thing is preserving open space, farmland, natural beauty, critical environmental areas. That's a little trickier at Stapleton because it was urban. It was in a former airport. There weren't any natural forests, okay? However, however, they went in, and I remember this at the very beginning, they had a really good idea of the contours of the, there were actually some natural drainages to the site. And what they, what they did is they, they planned the development so that they could actually create new streams and rivers that flowed through the site, okay? And that recreated a natural sense. And then they built the parks along those. And I just want to go back. You can see it. Oh, wait. I have to do this again. Hold on. Um, back there. To give you an idea, this um, is a natural drainage way here. OK? But pretty much all the other drainage ways, the creeks that went into it have been destroyed. These were reestablished. So when you see this green, these little fingers are new drainage ways that were established to be like tradition, like natural ones, and they built the parks along them. So in fact, we followed the spark growth principle of establishing drainage ways. Okay, down here, open space. We, 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 we established critical environmental areas. That was important. And oriented the community to them. Okay, fine. And there's just these other principles, and we're done. Um, this is an important thing. Strengthen and direct development towards existing communities linked to existing streets, open spaces, and development patterns. This was very, very important at Stapleton because it was surrounded by existing development. In other words, there were old neighborhoods nearby that uh, were right next to Stapleton. Um, that in the past, when there was an airport, there was like a wall, and there was a fence around Stapleton. You had the housing and the neighborhoods, and then there was this area that was the airport. You couldn't go through there. So what we did was we reestablished, once the airport was gone, we brought those streets through the site, east and west and north and south, and we connected the parks, we connected all the bikeways, so that it knitted together as a community what we, with what was there. And we used the same idea of city blocks, square city blocks. We brought them into the site. This was very, very important, so that it was like the surrounding area and it, and it was not an abrupt, there was no abrupt transition going from the existing city, the old city, into the new. That's a really, really important principle and that people are getting back to is you want to tie those together so that you know the new and the old are different, but they're linked together so it's easy to go back and forth. Okay. Uh, provide a variety of transportation choices. This is important. Again, getting people out of the cars the automobiles are great. We love them. We all, you know, we like to aspire to own automobiles, but maybe not all the time because of the impacts. It just <coughs> impacts in terms of pollution, 
use of land in streets, traffic congestion, wasted time, getting fat, sitting in the car, not talking to people. So cars are nice, but not all the time. That's sort of an, that's an aspirational goal in this country. And I know that many of you come from countries where you're just getting to use cars, and they're very exciting. But once you can have too many cars, that's what we've experienced here. Um, and they're getting increasingly expensive. And so to offer alternative choices for transportation, you know, for students, you know, bus systems and things like that. And so we planned the streets and the entire development to take advantage of, of, of transit as well, transit at a regional scale and local. And as it turns out, the train they're going to build as part of fast tracks, or, you know, the train system that, you see, that goes right by DU, that's going to be extended to, to Denver, to the airport. It goes right through the middle of this project. And there's going to be a major station in the middle of Stapleton. So, in fact, people will be able to use that station to go downtown, and from downtown to DU, and to other places, or to the airport. They'll just, they won't need a car. It will be possible to live there without a car. And there are buses that go through the development that go to the train station with those connector routes. And so people can live there and not have to own a car. Or if they own a car, maybe they don't have to have three cars. Or they don't have to use their car as much. And those are all improvements. They're all small improvements that help. So alternative modes are very important. And we even think about, you know, encouraging people to walk. That's an alternative mode. Ride a bicycle. That's fine. Um, this nine is less a physical thing, but it's very important. It has to do with the process. The process has to be transparent. Do you understand when we talk about transparent, transparent government, yeah. transparency? That means that the people, like you and I, know what's going on in general. It's not secret. And there aren't bribes being paid and, and special favors for privileged people. But it has to be a transparent process. Because the public then has faith that it's fair. It's really important. So in terms of getting a development, the owner, the, the, the developers had to come in and work for the city and to decide where the housing was going to be, how much it was going to cost, um, what the variety of uh, what the variety of housing, um, how how many public facilities were there. That was all done in a transparent process. And we were I was heavily involved in that, where in fact as a citizen, you could find out what the government was talking with the developer about. It was all, it wasn't secret. And that was very important because then the public realized this is a fair deal. It isn't just a bunch of developers making a lot of money with the government. The work bribes or anything like that. It was open and honest and it was a fair deal. That's very, very important in a sustainable environment because you've got to have trust between the government and the, and the citizens and the, and the other stakeholders and the developers. There has to be some level of trust. And I think in the United States, they've made a lot of progress with that in the last 15 years, is that they're open and, and, and people are not trying to cheat each other as much. Um, number and finally, 10 is, again, related the, to, the, to the process of the transparency, is to get the people to work together. As I said, the city had the land, and they said, we have the land which we want to see certain things happen, so we'll establish these principles that we want to see followed. But we'll hire a developer who knows how to build a community to do this. And then the developer is considered a stakeholder. And then the surrounding neighborhoods where people lived were concerned what was going to happen with the site. Because they didn't want to have some terrible development there that would have a lot of crime and things. They're called stakeholders. They were involved in the process. Okay? And the airport, they're a stakeholder because when they moved, they had to coordinate with um, the with, with with the development in terms of how how they moved out of the site and such, and then of course other levels of government. The federal government was involved, state the state government. All those are stakeholders, and there's a process whereby they all work together in an open and transparent manner that was successful. So there's a lot of trust in that process. So that's a very very important thing for sustainability. So anyway, that's the story of Stapleton. I really encourage you to go out there and look around. Because it's a neat, it's an interesting place. If you get in there, you know, drive, take a bus, walk around, you get an idea of what it looks like when you do all this stuff. Okay, it, the end result's very good, and people love living there. That's the interesting thing. People love living there.
and of course, as a result, the values are high and all those kinds of things. Even in the down economic downturn, where all that price of housing dropped, Stapleton stayed pretty well because people realize it's a good community. So, anyway, that would be concluding my little um, talk here about uh, sustainability. I think that's it. So, Kathy? Yeah. Oh, no, here, okay, yeah, there we go. Here's the final picture. This was a couple years ago, but you can see this is taken from the air. This is downtown in the mountains. DU is going to be over, over here. Okay, and you can see, if you can imagine, this was a giant airport with runway right there. And now we brought in the streets. See, the streets connect. Okay, the open space connects. That was an existing park. It links over to here, okay? And the water flows down there so it doesn't cause pollution. You know, all that water quality stuff, it meets all those rules. Okay, there is a variety of housing. I mean, this is a school here, and there's single family houses. These are apartments and condominiums here. This is the commercial center. This is a big regional center, Kmart, all those kinds of things. So, anyway, I encourage you to go see it. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you.